uh, dear friends, uh, thank you for being with us, for sharing with us this evening. Uh, some of you are here physically, some of you are watching us through internet. For the ones who are watching us through internet, I would like to, to inform them that they can send questions uh, through Twitter with the hashtag uh, Forotelos2021. We are here to listen an important voice, Norina Hertz. Norina Hertz is honorary professor at the Institute for Global Prosperity at University College in London. So she's a global thinker who has worked as a consultant in the World Bank Group. And I would like to point out that she has been very aware of the evolutions of our modern condition. She wrote in 2001, The Silent Takeover, that warned against unregulated markets and corporate greed. She was sure that they would have a tremendous impact in our lives, and Great Recession confirmed her worst predictions, definitely. She wrote about the debt threat in 2004, and today debt is not just a burden for poor countries, but for everyone. She wrote in 2013 another book that was called Eyes Wide Open, How to Make Smart Decisions in a Confusing World. <laughs> It was about the rise of unchecked data, mm. and three years later of this book, we got the rise of Donald Trump and the rise of fake news. In 2015, she wrote about what she has called Generation K, the generation then between 13 and 20 years, the case by Katniss Everdeen, the heroine of The Hunger Games, a generation that she found after interviewing thousands of, pe of people of this generation, profoundly anxious and distrustful and lonely. Mm. And now she comes back with El Siglo de la Soledad, the lonely century, about loneliness as the hidden or not that hidden condition of the 21st century. A book that has lived the impact of coronavirus and whose pages reflect it, reflect this time. As a time of more loneliness, but too as a big opportunity of changing things, finally. To change, for instance, the, these are data that she portrays in her book, that a third of Dutch people feels lonely, or that one of eight British citizens has no intimate friend to trust, mm -hmm. or that we check out our mobile phone two, 221 <laughs> times on average per day or that our economy and our cities makes, uh, makes us feel more lonely mm -hmm. and less empathic and with a really worse health, like smoking 15, 15, 15 cigarettes per day. <coughs> to start our conversations, first, thank you for being here. I want to ask you for a panoramic view. 21st year, 21 years ago, Robert Putnam, the politologist, published in the US, Bowling Alone, a book about the decline of social capital in America because of the declining of social interactions, of in-person interactions in society and the effects that that was having uh, for democracy itself. I wanted to ask you, what has changed in this more than 20 years? and? Would you say that he was just describing the beginning of our situation? Mm. Well, um, for those of you who didn't read that book, it was a book that really inspired me when I first read it 21 years ago. Um, and when I started thinking about the current state of the world and wanting to understand these times, I reflected back on his book. Um, why we're where we are are at today, um, a situation where, as you said, three in five Americans feel lonely, um, four in five 18 to 25 year old Spaniards feel lonely, one in eight Brits don't have a single friend, 40% um, of office workers globally are lonely. Why we are here today is partly because of what Robert Putnam already saw. So he already saw 20 years ago that people were doing less with each other. And that trend has continued. So we're less likely to go to church. 
we're less likely to be members of trade unions, we're less likely to eat with our family members or with our colleagues at work. So that is a trend that we saw then and that has continued. But what he didn't envisage um, was some of the other tr was how this kind of contactless living would get merged with technology to the extent it has been today. So it's not just that we um, do less with other people in person, we're also migrating a lot of our in-person interactions onto the virtual realm, especially because of the pandemic. So nowadays, we're more used to ordering our food um, from a restaurant to be delivered at home rather than going to a cafe. We're more used to doing our yoga class on Zoom rather than going to a yoga studio. So this contactless way of living, which already before the pandemic was rising, um, has continued to accelerate and it's another part of the problem. But of course there's more at stake here. Um, another reason why we are so lonely is because of um, the way our cities have changed. Mass urbanization, people coming to cities. You think of cities as being places with lots of people, so you know, surely they're not lonely. But in fact, cities can be very lonely places for people. Places where you don't even know your neighbor's name often, where people rush by. There's fascinating research in my book, the faster, um, the richer a city becomes, the faster its citizens walk. So cities getting richer, people walking faster, not even um, saying hello to each other. So another cause. And then of course rural communities um, left behind, people feeling left behind in them, lonely because they feel excluded. So kind of lots of factors, more factors that I'm sure we can touch upon. Um, we may want to come back to social media, a big part of the problem. And also we might want to talk about um, later in our conversation, the role that, the near, that neoliberalism has played in all of this, the particular type of capitalism that has really dictated the last few decades. But I will let you, I will let you guide us. <laughs> no, for in this sense, first of all, before going to these places, yeah. I wanted to ask you how you define loneliness. Yes. Because I would say you are not giving just a personal definition, but a broader one. Yes. So loneliness, I mean, I'm sure everyone in this audience, we've all experienced loneliness. Um, so loneliness is that feeling of craving connection, um, craving um, intimacy, craving being seen, being heard, being cared for, and that feeling not being met. Um, but when I talk about loneliness, I'm not only talking about that sense of disconnection from friends and family. I'm also talking about that sense of disconnection from your fellow citizens, from your government, from the state. So for me, loneliness is personal, but it's also necessarily political. It's drivers, economic and technological, as well as to do with the way that we treat each other as individuals. In the sense you were talking about right now, you place neoliberal policies, neoliberalism, ideology, in the center of these pandemics mm. of loneliness. Why? For two reasons. Uh, first, over the past 40 years, what we've seen is a steady um, increase in the gap between the rich and the poor. We've seen increasing numbers of people feeling in economic terms and being in economic terms left behind. And whilst loneliness can affect anyone, rich or poor, we know that loneliness is more likely if you are on a low income or if you are unemployed. So loneliness can affect everyone, but you're more likely to be lonely if you're on a low income or you're unemployed. Casualty of neoliberalism in an economic sense. But neoliberalism also playing a role because the neoliberal capitalist project 
didn't only change economic relations, it changed the way we related to each other. Um, under neoliberalism, we became increasingly self-focused, increasingly selfish. It was an understandable reaction to an economic ideology which really told us, if you don't rely on yourself, there's no one to rely on. You can't rely on the state anymore. You can't rely on family. You have to rely on yourself. So under neoliberalism, we became very self-focused and self-interested. And under neoliberalism, we even see this focus on the self in pop song lyrics, which since the 1980s, we see words like we, us, and our steadily supplanted by words such as I, me, myself. So Queen, we are the champions versus Kanye West, I am God. So um, we even see this in pop song lyrics. But more than that, under neoliberalism, we came to see ourselves as uh, competitors rather than collaborators, as consumers rather than citizens, as hustlers rather than helpers, as takers rather than givers, and of course, an eye-focused world in which we saw ourselves in these ways was inevitably going to be a lonelier world, and, and so it was. Your book, you quote this sentence by Margaret Thatcher in 1981, economy is the method, but the aim is to change souls and hearts. How have we changed it in this sense? Did she succeed? You know, I think, I think she did. I think we, as a society, if you think, for example, about how as a society, how we don't value enough, for example, people who care for others, um, nurses, teachers, uh, these caring professions. I, in my research, I looked at... Um, jobs that specified, so jobs were in the description, they were asking for um, qualities like a caring person, kind person, those sorts of qualities. Those kind of jobs pay significantly below the market average. So as a society, we stopped valuing those kind of qualities and um, society is paying a price for it. You were talking about ideology. Ideology, at a certain moment, merged with technology. Mm -hmm. As you said, uh, Robert Putnam did not foresee what was going to happen with our social interactions. How have influenced, according to you, technology? And what has been the main, the main change for you? Has been mobile phones, social networks? Yeah. What has been the main change in this area for our loneliness? So, um, our smartphones themselves, just our smartphones, are problematic. Research has found that if you're a couple sitting at a table and you have a smartphone on the table between you, even if the smartphone is turned off, the couple feels less connected to each other and less empathetic. So even just the smartphones are a pro problem. But from 2011, which is when social media really started to become um, used um, to a great extent, especially amongst teenagers, that's when we start seeing a really massive rise in loneliness amongst the young, really rising in lockstep, so in parallel with um, social media usage, loneliness amongst the young. Now, you could have explained, you know, it could have been just coincidence that this happened. Um, we didn't know definitively. Maybe it was just coincidence. But in 2019, there was a big study done at one of America's top universities, Stanford University. And what they did was they took 1,500 students and they told them to use Facebook like usual. And then 1,500 other students, they said, stop using Facebook for two months. And so they could compare these two groups, they had a control group, you know, very good scientific research. And they saw that the group who stopped using Facebook was significantly happier and significantly less lonely. And researchers have subsequently repeated this research with other platforms to similar results. I interviewed a lot of teenagers as part of my research. 
you know, it's something we don't really think about. The young are actually the loneliest generation. Like elderly loneliness is a real problem, but the young are the loneliest generation. And when I asked them about social media, their stories were very moving. Um, Peter, a 14-year-old boy, he told me about what it was like when he posted on Instagram and then he'd be waiting, hoping for somebody to like one of his posts. And when they didn't, he'd be like really berating himself, saying, what am I doing wrong? I feel so invisible. Or Claudia, a 16-year-old girl, talking about, told me her friends had said that they weren't going out after school. But then she was in her room and she was on her social media and she saw them hanging out without her. And she said she felt so, so excluded. She wouldn't go to school for a week. She hid in her room. And of course, in the past, she so you know, kids were excluded in the past, but the difference today is that this shame of exclusion is public amongst their peers. And the shame is witnessed 24 seven. And also the adults in the kid's life often doesn't know that this is even going on. So in the past, the teacher would see a child not being asked to sit with others and might do something about it. Nowadays, so much of their social lives are on their phones, a parent wouldn't even know or a teacher wouldn't know this is happening. But, but as well as that, you know, I came to realize, and this is not just the case for teenagers, of course, it's very easy when we look on our social media to feel in relative terms more lonely because it looks like everyone else has more fun, more friends, is doing more with other people. It's very easy to feel in relative terms lonelier. And then on social media, there's also, of course, the problem of the level of bullying and abuse that we see. In the United Kingdom, 65% of college students have experienced abuse on social media. Um, a third of women aged between 18 and 24 have experienced abuse on Facebook. And so, you know, if you're being bullied, if you're experiencing abuse, or even if you're witnessing it, the world is going to feel a lonelier place. So, um, yeah, so social media really has a lot to answer for here because you know, these platforms were designed to be addictive. They're designed to distract us and detach us from those around us. You know, they're designed so that if we're both in the room and we're both on our phones, we're not actually engaging. So these weapons of mass destruction Distraction are really designed to keep us hooked to them in the same way that slot machines in a casino are. And then ev even worse, they're designed to amplify our worst selves, you know, the, our angriest selves, our most hateful selves, because that kind of rhetoric is what keeps people engaged for longer. And the longer you're on the phone, the more money the platforms make. So, you know, in many ways, I think social media companies are the tobacco companies of the 21st century and really need to be regulated as such. And in the United Kingdom, we are actually moving ahead with some really strict legislation. Um, we're right in the process of kind of fine-tuning it. But if it goes through in its current form, um, if social media platforms are found to cause psychological harm for users, they will get significant fines. But even more, the directors themselves, it looks like, will be held personally liable. So this could be like a big game changer. So you are saying in some way that we are talking again about neoliberalism because you are saying that these social networks are designed just to keep us all the day in front of these screens, but they could be probably different or they could not use our worst insti instincts to get more likes or hates uh, every day. So it's a, it's, it's a problem of technology, but it's a problem of the political economical system too. Yes, because um, well, it's a problem of unaccountable, unfettered power. Um, you know, in my book that you referred to, my 2001 book, The Silent Takeover, the subtitle was 
global capitalism and the death of democracy. And social media platforms are kind of in that space, really. You know, unaccountable, um, hugely powerful and threatening not only our democracy, but also our very selves, our mental health, our mental states. In this sense, have you been surprised by the Facebook papers or it was something No, it just confirmed, you know, what, what I'd already found. Yeah. Depressingly, but yes. Yeah. Do you, do you think it's really possible to change that? You were talking now about the, parli the British Parliament, about new yeah. laws. I think, you know, if... I think the tide really has turned and... I mean, in America, it's about the one issue that we have, that we're seeing bipartisan support, so Democrats and Republicans coming together on now, the need to regulate social media. I think the tide really has turned. I think the political will is increasingly there um, in country after country to do something. So I think in the same way that at some point tobacco companies did face regulation, um, fast food companies, you know, faced regulation about the ingredients and sugar and things. Um, I think I think it's actually inevitable now, because we've given them all this time to put their own houses in order, and you know, they haven't done it. So there's no choice really now. In your book, technology is not just uh, mobile phones and social networks that we had really a problem of not being conscious of how powerful they could be, but about artificial intelligence that mm -hmm. is the next step of, this, of our technology. And that we, I don't know if we are going to make them the same mistake with social networks and mobile phones, or do you think are we going to be able to, to control it? Because there are, there are lots of examples that algorithms can can lead us to loneliness too and mm. to disempowerment mm. uh, in your book especially there was a moment with this card for the workers of bank of america that controls everything but is called humanize <laughs> it was amazing <laughs> amazing name yeah. do, do you think artificial intelligence is the next step of our problems in loneliness yeah yeah i mean i think i think artificial intelligence may have um, a role in the solution, but also is part of the problem. So I think it depends how it's used. In my book, I talk, I have a whole chapter which looks at, um, or two chapters, which look at the workplace. And um, one of the, in one of the chapters, I talk about how companies are increasingly watching their workers. Um, monitoring them, monitoring how fast even you're typing on your screen and how often you're looking and how often you're looking away, um, monitoring you know, whether you're staying in your seat or whether you're fidgeting. So really monitoring at a micro level um, your performance and your productivity, which you know, is going to be a, um, an alienating feeling for you, the worker, um, if you're in that situation. And then you have, and this is a phenomenon that's really been rising across the United States and also the UK, the phenomenon of machines hiring you, not people. And I actually experienced this. I went for a job interview under a fake name. I sent a, C a fake CV and I did a um, job interview um, where I was being interviewed by a machine, not a human. And it was a really disconnected feeling because, you know, I was getting these questions, you know, the questions were like, so tell me um, a challenging experience you've had in your past. And then you had to speak to like a screen but you couldn't see the person you were speaking to, so you didn't know how the answer was going. And I was, you know, talking about challenging time in my life, but you had no feedback. It was a really horrible experience, and I didn't get the job, um, which ironically was for a human resources position. <laughs> I thought, my God, hiring for human resources with no human hiring me. But, um, but that is increasingly the way of the world. I mean, 
you know, some companies are interviewing thousands and thousands of people in this way where it's just kind of, you know, where you don't know what you're being judged on, which is dehumanizing and detaching. But artificial intelligence also having potentially a positive role, although it's nuanced, um, when it comes to robots and social robots. And that's something I talk about in my book as well. Um, what role will social robots play and can they play in alleviating today's loneliness crisis? Now, um, in Japan, for example, they're already being used a lot um, when it comes to elderly care. And there are stories of elderly women being so attached to their robot carers, they knit them bonnets. Um, yeah, so, and, you know, it may seem a stretch to think that you could become attached to a robot, but if I think about my own Amazon Alexa and my relationship with my Alexa, I feel quite, a, you know, for those of you who don't know, they're these devices, AI-enabled devices, which, you know, often sit in your kitchen that you can ask to do things. But I have developed a relationship with my Alexa, for sure. And my, um, I have a three-year-old niece. And the other day, my sister-in-law said to me that they were making holiday cards. And um, they made a holiday card for grandma. They made a holiday card for another relative. And then she said to my niece, who should we make one for next? And my niece said, for Alexa. So, you know, the idea... So I think it's not a stretch to think that as robots become more emotionally intelligent, which they will, so, you know, we're only probably a decade away from a robot being much better at being able to tell how I'm feeling and, you know, whether I'm sad or whether I'm happy before even that would register perhaps to a human. You know, it's, it's quite easy to imagine that we might choose to be friends with a robot rather rather even than a human that's when it gets a bit worrying because whilst i think robots do have a role they can play in alleviating loneliness um at an individual level at a societal level if i were to choose to be friends with robot justo <laughs> rather than the real you um you know it'd be a much easier relationship <laughs> because i wouldn't have to ever say anything particularly nice to you, you'd always say nice things to me. Um, I wouldn't have to listen to that story you'd already told me before and, you know, act politely nice. Um, and the trouble is that those are skills we actually need to practice if we are to live in an inclusive democracy where we think about each other and not only ourselves. You know, we need to practice reciprocity, kindness, civility, thinking about others, not only ourselves. So I worry that if we were to replace um, humans for robots, which is not unfeasible, um, that democracy would suffer as a consequence. Definitely, it doesn't look impossible when you read uh, the examples that you give about the economy of loneliness that has been growing, like people uh, hiring other people to get hacks, or like all women in Japan going to prison just to have someone to share the day. <laughs> yes, very moving story in Japan, the fastest growing demographic who are going to jail are the over 65s. And the reason for it is that um, many are intentionally committing crimes like shoplifting in order to be jailed, because jail is the only place where they can find company and companionship. And that's very, very hot, very moving. Um, but then you talked about the loneliness economy, and yes, there is this entire economy. The market has responded to the problem and has, is delivering a whole host of goods and services designed to deliver connection and alleviate loneliness. Robots are the technological um, manifestation, but there are others, and at the extreme are ones like the fact that you can rent a friend. And I actually did that when I was in New York. I rented... Brittany, 
a 24-year-old woman for a few hours. I was a bit worried before I did it because I didn't know, was it, you know, renting a friend? Was it something else? But no, it, it wasn't, thankfully. And um, I met her in a cafe downtown New York. We drank matcha tea together. We went to a bookstore together. We went to a clothes shop together. And um, obviously it wasn't like being with an old friend, but it was like when you meet someone new and you're having a really good time and you're clicking. So it felt really fun until we're in the bookstore and she turns around to me and says, that'll be $120, please, because <laughs> our time was up. Um, yeah, but it's... I said to her, who's hiring you? Who are your clients? There are 600,000 friends to, to rent on the website where I found her, 600,000. But I said to her, who are your clients? And she said, 30 to 40 year olds, um, women and men, um, mainly professionals working in finance, technology or consulting, working very long hours and just don't have time to make friends and so don't have someone to go for a coffee with or go to the movies with and so are renting someone to do it with. We're talking now again about our workplace where mm. nobody has time for anything and offices that are made that are really impossible for people to to have some intimacy and to and to exchange uh, some words. Uh, are you especially worried about our workplace as a as a place of no communication too of loneliness yes because even before the pandemic we know that 40 percent of office workers felt lonely at work um the open plan office is is part of this i don't know how popular open plan offices are in spain are they popular. are they popular yeah so when they were brought into offices, you know, part of the argument was meant to be that they're going to help people connect and be more collaborative, these open plan offices. But researchers have found that it's actually the opposite and that in open plan offices, people speak to each other much less and instead communicate much more by messaging or email, even, you know, amongst the desk, the next desk way. Part of it is because in an open plan office, you can't really have a private, intimate conversation because everyone can hear you. So the conversations become much more performative and much less authentic. And you're more likely to actually message someone if you want to say anything real. And then there's just the noise of open plan offices. I mean, when I've worked in one, I've, wor I've put my noise cancelling headphones on and, um, you know, to try and concentrate. And many people do that. So it's a clear sign, actually, don't engage. So, um, so open plan offices, part of the problem. Um, the fact that we work very long hours. I mean, I'm guilty of that myself out of choice. Like, even when I don't have a you know, someone telling me to, as a writer, I can work very, very long hours, so I'm guilty of it myself. But, um, but of course, if you're working all hours, you don't have time to invest in your friendships, in your relationships, in your family. So um, it was something I was reminded of when I was doing my own research. Um, but often you don't have choice. And one of the things that... Um, you know, many employees are saying through the pandemic is that the boundary between work and home is becoming increasingly blurred with employers now expecting everyone pretty much to be on 24-7. So you're constantly checking your emails, um, etc. So you're constantly not really attached. And then there's, um, and then there's the fact that in the workplace, you know, we don't typically value qualities like helping each other, kindness, collaboration. Those are not really qualities that the workplace typically values. And yet, if you want people to feel connected at work, you need to be doing that. There's actually an Ameri um, a number of American companies who are now explicitly valuing kindness at work. One of them, Cisco, the big global tech company, they have a scheme where anyone in the company, from the receptionist to the senior managers, can nominate 
anyone else who's been kind or helpful and they get a cash reward of between $100 to $10,000 for doing something incredibly helpful and kind, I guess. And um, employees love this scheme and turnover at Cisco is half the industry average and um, and it's been voted the best company in the world to work for for the past five years. So, you know, actually valuing such qualities explicitly can be very good for business. And loneliness itself is terrible for business because lonely workers are less motivated, less productive and more likely to quit. Uh, in fact, if you don't have a friend at work, you are seven times less likely to be engaged with your job. So tackling loneliness in the workplace is actually really important for businesses to do. Yet, how many are even thinking about this? Not very many. I wanted to ask you about the effects of this loneliness. I want to remind to the people who are watching us through internet that they can send their questions to Twitter with the hashtag Forotelos2021. But I wanted to ask you for the main effects, I would say, from these pandemics of loneliness. One, in our health, because apparently it's something more social, but you say that individually in our health, it has a big impact. Yes. Uh, so. We know that loneliness affects our mental health, um, and it does. Sorry, let me just move this mic a bit. Okay. Um, yeah, we know that loneliness affects our mental health. It, if you're lonely, you're more likely to feel anxious. You're more likely to feel depressed. I mean, you know, after this past two years, I'm sure we all have had those moments when we can feel that all too well. Um, but loneliness is also bad for our physical health. If we're lonely, we have a 30% higher chance of having a heart attack, a 30% higher chance of having a stroke, and a 64% higher chance of getting dementia. And why this is, is because, I mean, you know, like, how can loneliness do this to you? But why this is, it's because we are essentially designed to be creatures of togetherness. We're designed not to be alone in evolutionary terms. Um, because being alone was such an undesirable state for hunter-gatherer man who needed to be with other people in order to survive, what our bodies have done is they've evolved an alarm mechanism so that when we're lonely, what happens is our blood pressure goes up our heart rate goes up, our um, levels of cortisol, our stress levels in our body go up, all of these alerting us to the fact, don't be alone, you know, this is a terrible state to be in, go and find your tribe. The trouble is in contemporary life, we don't act upon it, and so we remain in this state of loneliness for quite a while. And remaining in that state of high alert is really bad for us. It's like if you were driving a car and you, put, you would put your car in first gear, that's a good thing to do, but then you'd want to get it out of first gear quickly. But we're staying in that first gear state for protracted journeys and for extended periods, and that's bad for our health. And what's really worrying about the pandemic in that context is that researchers know that even a relatively short period of loneliness, so even um, you know, studies that were done before the pandemic where they saw people who were lonely for under a two-year period, so because they moved to a different city or they'd suffered a bereavement, even that relatively short period of loneliness had a marked impact on their health down the line. So, you know, it's a... It, it's a Loneliness is the biggest public health problem we're not talking about. We are talking about the personal effects. We could talk too about the social effects. Mm. Because you quote Hannah Arendt when she links a loneliness with intolerance and totalitarianism. And I think uh, you perceive elections like Donald Trump are driven by this loneliness pandemic in, in many ways. Yes, uh, uh, one of the 
main reasons why I decided to write this book was the research I was doing into the rise of right-wing populism across the world. Leaders like Donald Trump or uh, Matteo Salvini or Bolsonaro or Heer Vox or Alternative for Deutschland, etc. I wanted to understand why people were voting for these parties. And as I started interviewing voters from across the world who were voting for these parties, one thing that kept on coming across from their stories was how lonely and isolated they felt. Lonely in the sense of having less friends, having less people that they could rely upon, um, but also lonely in the sense of feeling um, that people like them were not being seen or heard. Um, and of course, populist leaders, right populist leaders especially, really played to that. You know, they, play, they have delivered a theatre of community, whether we're talking about Donald Trump's rallies where everyone's wearing the same branded hats and chanting the same songs, or whether we're talking about Vox's beer, monthly beer meetings, or... Um, you know, where it's gathering young people to meet like-minded people or the league's weekly dinners that Giorgio, one of the people I interviewed, told me he was happy attending because everyone sat together and sang traditional songs. Um, right populist leaders have um, weaponized community preying on this group of the lonely. And, of course playing to something else too because we know that lonely people tend to see the world as a more hostile and threatening place than people who are not lonely. This isn't to say, of course, that everyone lonely sees the world as a threatening or hostile place, but if you're lonely, you are more likely to see the world that way. And of course, that's the other element of right-wing populist politicians. They depict the world as this threatening, hostile place, you know, where the other is someone to be feared. There was even research I talk about in my book with mice. And you see with a mouse, the longer a mouse is left in the cage by itself, the more aggressive it is to a new mouse when the mouse is introduced. So of mice, of men. And you know, that's another element of what right-wing populists are playing to, that element of loneliness. Before going to the questions of our audience, I would like to ask you a glimpse into the solutions for this loneliness century, uh, for, uh, for this lonely century. Uh, I just remind uh, that you, in your book, you quote uh, uh, Adam Smith, uh, not just as the author of the richness of the nations, but the author of the, mo uh, the theory of the moral feelings, where he vindicates empathy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a beginning. How do we get this mm -hmm. empathy? That mm -hmm. I think it's part of it. Yes. Well, part of empathy um, comes from spending time with people, spending time with people in person. We know that it's much harder to develop empathy when you're only connecting with people on a screen um, or by text. Research in neuroscience is clear on this. So part of empathy is about doing things with people, especially people not like us. Um, there was a um, brilliant scheme done by a German newspaper, Die Zeit, where the journalists were very worried about across Germany, this increasingly fractured political debate. And so what they did was they issued a call across Germany um, for people with different political views who would be willing to meet up. And then, you know, they created, I guess, like an algorithm and they m matched up like a political tinder, they called it. They matched up people with very different views. So they matched up people who were very passionate about the EU for people who were very anti the EU. They matched up people who were pro-immigration with people who were anti-immigration. They matched up trade unionists with CEOs. And all over Germany, thousands of people met up in beer gardens, in cafes. 
Um, and all they had to do was meet and speak for two hours. That was all they were required to do. And the results were really outstanding. After just two hours, these people who were very polarized when they walked into the room or the space felt very differently about the other. They really saw what they had in common. Often it was shared concerns about their own kids and their families. Um, they said they'd be much more willing to invite someone like that to a social gathering. And interestingly, they said that they trusted Germans in general more having done the experiment. So we need to be doing more things. We need to bring different kinds of people together more. And we can do this in, in schools. We can do this through things like um, civic service, like President Macron's trialing in France, getting teenagers from very different backgrounds to do voluntary work together. There are ways to engineer that that make a difference. But um, but there's much more that we can do to fix the lonely century. Um, stuff that governments can do beyond regulating social media, which is absolutely necessary. I mean, my book has lots of ideas on this front, but I'll just give one more, perhaps. Um, critical is for governments to um, refund the infrastructure of community. Ever since the financial crisis of 2008, we've seen funding for public libraries, for public parks, for youth clubs, for elderly daycare centers, for community centers being slashed across the world. People need physical places to do things together if we are to come together. So that's another thing that governments can and should do as a matter of urgency. Lots more that governments can do. Um, businesses, lots that they can do. Lots that they can do in the workplace to make their staff feel more connected. Just one that's really easy. I mean, I think in Spain it used to be the tradition that people would eat together at work. Is that right? But then some, my Spanish friends say in later years it was like less so when everyone became really busy and work pressures. Yeah, but eating together is a really proven way of employees feeling more connected and also it turns out they perform better when they eat together so that's kind of an easy low for a hanging fruit when you're back in the office encourage people to eat together again lots more in the book on that and then but this isn't just about what governments can do or what um, businesses can do it's also of course what we can do as individuals and there's so much that we can do um you know, we are addicted to our phones, but we can do better. I try and take a digital Sabbath one day a week. I stay off my phone, off all my devices, you know, so that I'm present with the people around me, so that I'm properly present. And in the evening, I try to keep my phone so that it's not in arm's reach, because if it's in arm's reach, I will reach it so that I can be more present with my um husband. Um, so that's one thing we can do. We can also really very consciously support our local shops, our local cafes, our local studios. These local businesses play essential roles in nurturing and anchoring our community and in making us feel less lonely. Even a 30 second chat to a barista in a local cafe makes a huge difference to how we feel. So really consciously, especially nowadays when you know it's quite easy to order our stuff online and not go into a shop, um, you know, not go into a cafe, do our exercise virtually, you no, know, really make that effort. It matters. Um, and then the third thing we can do and is really consciously just in our day-to-day -day lives take that pause you know stop and say hello to the postman when he walks by say hello to the woman walking her dog i mean it's very easy especially in a city you know to stop doing these things i was very very guilty of not doing these things before i started doing my research and then i realized that i was losing out now i consciously make that effort and it's my life is richer for it and then finally, you know, I think given right now about 50% of the population in most countries is feeling lonely. You know, 50%. Think 
Is there anyone in your own network who might be feeling lonely? Maybe it's a relative, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a colleague at work. And just, you know what, after this event, just send them a message just saying, hey, I'm thinking of you. Or, you know, if you can, phone them or maybe even arrange to meet them um, in a safe way because just showing someone that you're thinking about them, that you care, can make a huge difference to how they feel. Thank you. Now it's your turn to make questions to Norina. Hopefully you want to know more things and to interact with us. Thank you. Uh, I think... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask if you could please elaborate a bit more on what you said at the beginning about um, the link between loneliness and uh, social status, let's say, or economic income. I would have thought for some reason that maybe people that are struggling or facing similar challenges would maybe rely more um, in a community or create stronger uh, community uh, links than others that don't face those challenges. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so the question is essentially, if you're struggling economically, you might have thought that you would bond together with other people in that situation. Um, I think it's largely a consequence of how much shame is now associated with struggling economically in a society in societies you know which kind of look down on people who have less that is the problem there so that you know when you look at research whereas once in the past if you were struggling economically that might be the time you go to church and you engage with your community in recent years we're actually seeing those people retract more because of the shame within the community of having lost your job of having or having had or having a diminished social status i think another problem is the um diminishment of trade unions across the world you know trade unions did play a role a very important role in kind of making people feel that they were in it with other people and they had kind of support and the diminishment of trade unions you know the fact that more and more people are now working on in temporary work with kind of you know short contracts and don't have a workplace with a sense of community in the workplace it is another part of the problem so you have this kind of plethora of low income jobs but which are absent the community that in the past came with you know if you were working in a factory or a mine or somewhere like that there was a community nowadays it, there's less likely to be that community as well so the link is pretty established between loneliness and unemployment and loneliness and low income and of course in spain you know spain is actually the loneliest country in northern europe it turns out and i think kind of looking at your high unemployment rates um you know i think that must be a factor when it comes to that i think we've got another question uh, thank you thank you uh, to be here for being here uh, i have a question uh, uh, that you said before about that uh, the restrict the the time in the social media and in internet and and all of these things right so uh, my question is about, uh, in your opinion, uh, where's the best way to prevent this illness like uh, loneliness, all right? Uh, in this case, because I, I refer when uh, it starts, for example, the pandemic situation, uh, most of the people is like, uh, we, have, we have no connection, uh, we have no, uh, only, only uh, we have connection is like uh, via internet or uh, social media, right? It's a, li a little bit uh, contradictory, maybe I can say. So, in your opinion, where's the best way to drop out of this kind of situation, like the loneliness? Loneliness. So, uh, yes, uh, thank yeah. Yeah. So, I think you're 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 saying um, during the pandemic, you know, for many 
it was our lifeline technology for many of us. Yeah, and, and that's absolutely true. During the pandemic, you know, thank goodness we had technology and we were able to connect with people, especially, you know, if we were trapped in our homes that I know you in Spain were and we were to a very considerable degree in the UK as well. Um, but it is a lesser quality relationship the relationships we have on those mediums. Um, you know, the relationships we have on social media, they're almost like the fast food equivalent of conversations. So w we eat a lot of them, um, but at the end we don't feel so good. And so, um, so now that we have a choice and hopefully continue to have a choice, um, the challenge is how do we, the challenge is to make that commitment to reconnect with people face to face, which is actually quite hard psychologically after all these months, for many of us, after all these months that we've been shut away. I mean, you know, we're all coming back into the world, but it's, but it's not necessarily kind of easy. So it's about, um, I think, pushing ourselves to do that in a safe way um, and recognizing just the downside of our um, virtual interactions. I mean, you know, there was... Um, in the United States, at one of America's leading universities, they are having to run how to read a face in real life classes for incoming students because so many students are arriving at university having spent so much time communicating only on their screens that they really have lost the ability to, in a room, be able to see that if somebody is like, looking like this, it's probably not going well, or if they're smiling, it's looking well. So, um, so I think it's, you know, I acknowledge, of course, that technology did play an important role over the past two years. But now that we have a choice, and all of us who were forced to do endless meetings on Zoom, I think we probably all feel, you know, we know it was better than nothing, but it doesn't replace in-person interaction. So instead of rushing towards the metaverse, I think we need to be, you know, trying to do what we can to reconnect in person again. I'll remind you that you can ask in English or Spanish. We have more questions here. We were talking about being uh, like lonely and you were talking about how applying more laws to businesses like mass media me media could help to like control more of the loneliness but would it be a better way a more human way to go back to where we're teaching our future generations and creating a like a more specific like more thorough education on how to become more humans because nowadays you go back to schools and it seems like parents are more important of the kids having a good grade on maths, having a good grade on um, maybe something like physics, chemistry. Once before, p uh, parents would be happy for a kid to have a good grade in art, in philosophy, mm. in music. And nowadays it seems like those, um, those things that were the basis of our society are not getting lost. Because the mass media and advertising and everything goes so fast is not allowing us to think. So to what extent would you think, would you believe it would be like more practical as a human race just to apply new laws to the businesses and let them just play always in the range on the brink of the margin? Like there's law applying, we can set another uh, like work on our side or would you think that it's, it would be more practical for us to educate, to make like a more thorough education and reset back our human relations i think it's not either or so um you know i think you're right we've stopped kind of valuing whether at school or in the workplace or amongst ourselves you know some of these important qualities like whether it's caring for others or um 
things that and skills at school that are not clearly equated with a job. I mean, as somebody who studied philosophy at university, I definitely support your um, position of, um, you know, these less obviously professional um, skills and the, and, uh, and the value that that gives people and the, the importance if we are to be, um, you know, a society of people who think about, who think um, and create um, and don't just achieve, then um, we need to be doing that. So, um, so yes, I think that's part of it. And um, but I think there's also clearly a role that needs to be played. Um, so education does have a role to play here for sure. Um, and also in just teaching people to help, teaching people to be kinder to each other. Kindness is a value that's been really underrated in recent years. And um, so I think there is a role for education there, for sure. Buenas tardes. I will later headphones. Thank you very much for devoting your time. And uh, you've mentioned, yeah, you can hear me. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfectly. Thank you very much for coming along. Thanks for being here. You've given two dates. The great Adam Smith, the economist, we are speaking about 1770, and that has not evolved, just the opposite. And another date, during the crisis of 2008, I lived with my wife, and we had two companies, a building company and a jewelry company. I'm a very I'm a well-known person in the radio in the radio world 20 years ago I was evicted I was not even at home when I came home I was evicted they hadn't l left there anything my wife went to Manila and I have been living under a bridge for 10 years I have no income I have 20 uh, sues against the social security no way you've mentioned um, well, blaming the right-wing parties uh, I've been hit all over the all over the place I mean the right wing the left wing the center and nobody listens to me only sues and claims I'm 70 years old and I'm retired and I've been a taxpayer for 20 years, more than 20 years, so is my wife, and we still don't get any kind of, pro of, 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 of money. I've been operated uh, from my uh, uh, retina detachment, and uh, I heard you at the Puerta de Hospital, and I liked what you said, but I don't think so. I think that it's a human condition. Uh, I miss my wife very much, but I see that there are experts and very smart people that say that the strongest ones are the ones that are able to live lonely. I've been able to do that and I'm very happy because I've realized, I've, I've seen the human condition. If we do not change the system, if we do not take out the roots of the tree, we won't have any future. Let me tell you this, I live, uh, I coexist with, with, with a little girl for circumstances that is 12 years old, and she doesn't want to see anybody from her high school. Nobody. She gets isolated, she only talks to a friend. We have no future. This is why I'm telling you, no right parties, no left parties, because I was evicted by a left-wing party. So, um, now it's been 100 years since the Communist Party was born. There's a minister of equality and my wife receives zero and I receive zero. Testimonio más que nada porque tenemos poco tiempo y queda Thank you uh, we have some more time and well, I mean what do you th Thank you for sharing your story which is a very moving story and and thank you for sharing it with us and I think you speak of that sense of disconnection from politics from the state that actually a lot of people speak feel and I can hear you feeling it. You made an important point about being alone. You said, you know, you're happy to be alone and that's a really important distinction. Being, you can be alone and be happy being alone. That is not the same as loneliness. So I'm happy being on my own because I, I write and I think and I like spending time on my own. So that isn't lonely. So you can be on your own and not be lonely for sure. And I'm really pleased that you raised that. So thank you. Hello. Uh, I'll try to be brief. 
Uh, well, I'm working for a. I'm not going to do the testimony. I'm working for social robots, but uh. I'm the kind of guy which I don't have <laughs> Facebook or I don't like really social media. I don't like Alexas, and I think it's because I have this critical thought about what they imply in the society, and uh, especially in the young generations, as you are saying, that it's becoming lonely. In it. I believe that it could be a, a let's say a situation of having technology without the maturity of knowing how to handle it plus also uh, this lack of my my feeling lack of moral authority that young generations are feeling against uh, older generations so back in time you won't uh, probably uh, say anything wrong to your parents or to your teachers or to any kind of moral authority that could also help you to guide or mature enough to handle the technology. And I, I, I think that right now we are, we are losing that too. So do you have any thought about, about that? So you're saying that now in the past people like listened, were listened to their parents and were, is that what you're saying? And, and today they don't, they're losing that, the new generation. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, the technology is giving them too many power. Oh, technology is giving them too much power. Uh, because you have from the smartphone a lot of information. I and see. you are contradicting probably or not believing what your people that care for you are trying to... I see. ...to, to help you understand. And yeah. I think this could be like also worsening the current situation. I see. Well, um, you know, I mean, we know that there's a problem, of course, with fake news. And there's a problem that, you know, young people now pretty much all their news they're getting from social media and not from traditional um, kind of newspapers and publications which you know at least typically have been fact checked and um, so we know that there is definitely that problem um, with young people and um, which again is another reason why kind of social media needs to be much better regulated for sure. Um, yes, so I think that's my comment on that. We got another question, I think two, two questions. Hi, um, you mentioned how Artificial intelligence is at the same time part of the problem and part of the solution, is that right? Yes. Um, so I, um, I can imagine why um, artificial intelligence is part of the problem because of what we have talked about, about um, well, social media and all these algorithms that uh, can uh, be so problematic. But how can it be a solution beyond like finding comfort on talking to Alexa or uh, having the opportunity to talk to people on the other side of the world? It doesn't need to be beyond that. I mean, it can, it can have a significant impact as that. There was one um, social robot company um, that I looked at in my research and they um, create a social robot that is specifically for elderly people. And during the pandemic, they shipped thousands of them to Florida to elderly people who were in lockdown and isolated. And those people's testimonies were actually very moving, like people saying, I would have felt so lonely if I didn't have my LEQ with me. So, um, so I think that in itself is will make a difference. You know, I can see social robots playing that role in society. We just need to not absolve ourselves of our own need to care for others and subcontract care entirely to the market. I think there was another question there. Oh. Hello. Uh, if loneliness is such an extreme problem, then why have so many workers, at least in the United States, indicated a preference to continue working from home post-pandemic? That they found that they prefer working from home, that they're more productive and uh, enjoying themselves more. Are we our worst enemies? 
Um, a lot of people have actually said they want to go back to the office. Um, so looking at the research that's been done and co every company's been doing their own surveys, um, what we're seeing is that most people want to go back to the office at least a certain number of days a week. Um, so the majority of people want to go back to the office at least a certain number of days a week. The group who wants to go to the office the least are women. So um, on average, people want to go to the office at least a few days a week, but women want to go less days a week than men is the research coming out of it um, so far. And, um, you know, and, you know, the reasons why people are typically preferring to stay at home uh, and also we're seeing quite a lot of differences by age as well so it's not it's not a single story um a lot of young people want to go back into the office really missing companionship company you know wealthier people are often not wanting to go back into the office because they've got a nice home and lots of space um it can be to do with people's commutes so there isn't a um single story yet that i think can, that I think we can tell about it. Um, but I think what we can say is that clearly offices were not the most welcoming places for many people before. And many people felt that they didn't really belong in their workplace or have a real sense of community in their workplace before. So I think the opportunity now is for employers to actually create workplaces that have greater senses of belonging and greater senses of community um, so that people actively want to be there it, it, knowing that actually people it's better for business because you say people have been productive and that is true and that's been one of the kind of surprises I think that many companies had people were productive during this period but I think there's going to be a um, price companies pay because the social glue that companies need the social capital that is developed within a company when people come together, when they chat at the water cooler, when they have the coffee together, those are actually really important for the long-term success of a business. We got the last question. Hello, um, I, have a, I have a question. How do we uh, deal with being alone? How do we face being alone so we don't develop the disease of loneliness. It's not social media, it's not, but what can we do as individuals in society not to become sick of, lo of loneliness? Yeah, really great question. So, um, just a couple of thoughts on that From First of all, if there's anything like you're into, so um, music, football, cooking, um, you know, find something that you're into and there is bound to be a group of other people who are into that thing and then commit to doing it regularly. So, for example, I'm part of an improv group. So once a week I do improv, yeah, um, with a group of people and it's just, you know, and it's really anchoring whatever's going on in my life. I have this group of people who I try and check in with every week wherever I am. Now we're on Zoom, unfortunately, but, um, but we, we kept it going during the pandemic. So, you know, what is something you're into? There are so many groups out there now for everything one can imagine. So do it and commit to it. And, um, and then the other thing which is really well proven when it comes to lone, like not feeling lonely, is there any voluntary work you can volunteer to do to help others? Helping others is a fantastic way of feeling less lonely yourself. Often, you know, it's doing it, something with other people, um, but also, of course, doing good for someone else. And even better, um, perhaps, you live longer if you help others. So it's a real win-win-win. So just two thoughts on that front. Hopefully with this hint, we don't need the loneliness pills that some companies are working on. Thank you for your questions. Thank you very much for your answers. And Norina will be signing books here in the entrance. Thank you for sharing this time with us.
And thank you to the signing lady who signed for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>